to beat the computer. There was so much to be done. The rats met twice more while Mrs. Frisbee was with them. Together, they made three decisions. The first was that they must learn as much about computers as they could. The second was that a group of rats must enter a special training program for the assault on the dam. From this group, a smaller number would be chosen to perform the actual mission. The third was that the remainder of the colony would be evacuated to a safe place just before the opening of the dam. They would carry with them only tools and seeds, for they hoped to return to the nest in Thorn Valley after the mission. They enlisted the help of their trusted allies, Mrs. Frisbee and Jeremy, in the struggle. From them, they would learn as much as possible about the farmer's plan of resistance. Nicodemus would mail letters to the largest computer companies for up-to-date information and have it sent to the address of a vacant farmhouse down the road from the Fitzgibbons. Jeremy could pick up the replies from the mailbox and fly them directly to Thorn Valley. Justin was in charge of the training program, which was held in the mornings before breakfast and in the evenings after school or work. Forty rats signed up for the sessions, but Justin made it clear that only fifteen would be chosen for the final mission. Try not to be disappointed if you're one of those who is asked to stay here, he said. Remember that the evacuation of Thorn Valley is work just as vital to our survival as the mission itself. The young rats nodded. Still, Raxo was sure that he would be chosen. After all, he had thought up the idea. And during the training sessions, Justin would have a good chance to observe his prowess. Not only that, but wait until Justin and the others tasted the candy. He would be a hero, after all. Soon, even Nicodemus would have to say so. Raxo looked around. By now he knew all the other rats by name. Brendan, Sally, Christopher, Nolan, Beatrice, Brutus. Timothy was here, of course, and next to him was Isabella. She had chosen a seat directly in front of Justin. Each time Justin glanced in her direction, she smiled and flitted her eyes at him. Justin pretended not to notice. Raxa wished Isabella would flit her eyes at him. The training was hard. In the mornings, the rats ran the entire distance between Emerald Pond and the lower part of the mountain trail. They practiced digging tunnels, climbing steep rocks, and running one by one through an obstacle course. They practiced diving for cover on command and not coming out until Justin blew the whistle that meant all clear. In the evenings, Arthur lectured them about computers. He loved machines, and his enthusiasm was infectious. The young rats were incredulous, as Arthur described tiny chips of silicon that could hold thousands of pieces of information. When we were captives in Dr. Schultz's laboratory, the scientists shared a computer in a room just down the hall from us, he said. We used to let ourselves out at night to go look at it. It was big, almost as big as a piano. Today, that same computer's memory could be stored in a space as small as the surface of a pebble. Next, Arthur drew a picture of a computer on the blackboard, and he labeled its parts. The terminal, the keyboard, the viewing screen, the disk drive. The computer plays the disk in the same way that a Photograph plays a record, he explained. The disc has instructions on it, and the set of instructions is called a program. Who will program the computer that runs the dam? Christopher asked. The humans have probably developed their program already, Arthur said. I expect it will be at the dam site when we arrive, stored in a special file. We will use their program to create ours. On the night before the dam is to open, we plan to erase their program and substitute ours on the same disks. In December, Raxo got into trouble. It started when he gave Christopher a really wonderful Christmas present. He found out later that the rats weren't in the habit of giving 
Christmas presents. But how could he have known that? Timothy said, you could have asked me, but Raxo scowled and looked the other way. What good was a suggestion that came too late? The present was a purple headband covered with glitter. The glitter came from chips of mica that Raxo had carefully picked off a rock beside the creek. The headband itself was made of birch bark paper he had painted purple one day at school. Raxo pasted the shiny chips on one by one. He tried the headband on himself, using the pond as his mirror. It was great. Raxo thought he looked like a rock star he had seen on TV back in the city. He tried swinging his hips and singing the lyrics to the star's latest hit, Sweet Lorinda in a falsetto voice. He hated to give the headband up, but he did, and he congratulated himself on being so generous. The problem happened because Christopher liked the present too much. He wanted to wear the headband all the time. He went around singing the lyrics of Sweet Lorinda under his breath so that he couldn't hear what anyone said to him. Sometimes he wouldn't even answer Raxo. Then Sally made herself a glitter headband. She looked a lot more glamorous than Christopher, and she had a higher, sweeter voice when she sang Sweet Lorinda. Christopher had learned to swing his hips the way Raxo had showed him, and he could shuffle all four paws in a dance that was a pretty good imitation of a real star. When it was his turn to recite his lessons, he danced and sang instead. Then Sally wanted to sing too. Hermione tried to be tolerant, but she had some misgivings about the way things were going. Most of the students were still trying to learn their lessons, but the atmosphere in the classroom seemed different. Raxo realized later that he should have waited longer with his next idea. It was an old trick, of course, but before he had learned how to read, he hadn't been able to do it. He explained it to Timothy one night in their bedroom. All you do is reverse the order of the letters. Then you sound them out. It's like a secret language. Wow, Timothy grinned. That's neat. My old man showed me how. He did it on my name. I liked the way it sounded so much that after that, I never wanted to be called anything else. <clears throat> Let's see. Timothy bent over a piece of paper. R A C S O. Then I turn them around. O S C A R. Oscar, is that your real name? Roxo chuckled. <laughs> it was, but I changed it officially when I ran away from home. Oscar sounds like a sissy, but Roxo sounds tough. Let's see what my name would be. Timothy scribbled the letters, then changed them around. Yatomit. Sounds like a guy from outer space, doesn't it? <laughs> or some kind of monster, Raxo smiled. Want me to call you that? Sure. At first, Timothy and Raxo just used the backward language in their bedroom, or when they wanted to share a special secret. But then Timothy told Brendan, who became Nadnerb, and the next day, Yelaus and Repotshirk joined the club. Then they began to say, say, and on, instead of yes and no, and Yalav Norat instead of Thorn Valley. They called Justin Nitsaj and answered Knesserp, when he called the role during the training sessions until after a few days he got irritated and told them to cut it out. They used the code in the schoolroom too. Raxo's favorite stunt was to throw in a few backward phrases when he was giving a report in front of the whole class. That way all the students would grab their pens and start writing down whatever he had said to try to figure out what it meant. Raxo thought it was a good way to learn spelling but Hermione disagreed. Her patience was wearing thin. She decided to go to Nicodemus for advice. 
It was about that same time that Brendan figured something out. They were sitting in the cafeteria with Christopher and Timothy when he asked Raxo, where did you learn about the backward code? <clears throat> My father showed me, but since I didn't know how to read and write, I couldn't do it. He had to help me. Who taught your father how to read? Raxo gulped. Suddenly, the conversation had become dangerous. There's a tutor at the mansion, and my old man overheard him teaching the kids, so he picked it up there. Brendan was dubious. Mm -hmm. He seemed to be thinking out loud. It's quite a coincidence that you turned up at Thorn Valley, the only other place in the world where rats can read and write. Not only that, but Thorn Valley is a secret. Rats outside the valley don't know about it. Some do, Raxo said weakly. My father did. He might have had some connection with Nim in the past, Brendan continued. The rats in the laboratory got special shots that made them smart. There is no evidence that an ordinary rat could have learned to read. He did. Raxo felt as if he were entering a trap, as if the steel gates were going to slam behind him at any moment. He looked at Timothy for help, but Timothy looked away. Even Christopher had stopped singing and was interested in what Brendan was saying. <clears throat> Maybe your dad was at Nam, he suggested. Maybe he just never told you about it. Before Raxo could answer, Brendan said, All the rats who escaped, those who had gotten the special shots, that is, stayed together, along with Jonathan Frisbee and Mr. Ages. Some of the mice did get swept away in the air ducts, but everyone else traveled as a group until they finally settled under the rose bush at the Fitzgibbons farm, and then they stayed together until just before the move to Thorn Valley. I remember that in the history. Maybe your father's really a mouse, Christopher conjectured. Maybe he found his way out of the air ducts and that would explain why you're so short, Brendan smiled sweetly. <laughs> Raxon was scared and furious at the same time. He's not a mouse, and stop making up stories about him. Stop talking about it. Brendan seemed genuinely surprised at Raxon's outburst. You act like you're trying to hide something. I'm not. Raxon stared at the carrots in his bowl. He had lost his appetite. Brendan and Christopher. Christopher, to whom he had given the headband, had almost figured out about Jenner. A bargain struck. When Nicodemus asked to speak with him, Raxo actually felt relieved. He was not surprised that Nicodemus had some comments about the headbands and the backward code of language. It's not that there's anything wrong with them, Nicodemus said. It's just that there isn't that much right with them either. How much good does a rock star do? Do rock stars really make the world a better place? They're fun. Other things are fun, too. I know. Raxo tried to keep the disgust out of his voice. Like gardening and square dancing and playing hide-and-seek and eating your fresh vegetables and being a good little rat. Nicodemus raised his eyebrows. And some of the rats around here are losing their sense of humor, if you ask me, Raxo said darkly. It's hard to be light-hearted in a crisis. I'm in trouble, too. Raxo let the words slide out fast so that he couldn't take them back. What about? Lying and Jenner. What do you want me to do about it? Raxo's voice was weak. Help me? Advice? Raxo nodded. Nicodemus paused as if he were making a deliberate calculation. 
When he spoke, he sounded businesslike. All right, but the advice will cost you something. What do you mean? I'll give you advice, but before I do, you'll have to agree to this. To give up rock stars and code language for the rest of the winter until this sabotage unit leaves. But that's blackmail. Braxton was indignant. Nicodemus shrugged. Raxon pushed his lips together hard. He really needed advice, but he'd never thought that Nicodemus would pull a trick like this. On the other hand, what if Brendan figured out that Jenner was Raxo's father and that he'd been lying about it the whole time? He'd feel so humiliated he wouldn't be able to stay. He was stuck. Nicodemus seemed to sense what he was feeling. He looked sympathetic. Look, Raxo, he explained. There are troublesome times for us. With the damn crisis hanging over our heads, everyone is scared. We don't know what will happen or where we'll be six months from now. There's a danger that we could lose our direction. And if that happens, the mission will fail. Nicodemus paused. I have to do whatever I can to keep the community united. Till this crisis is over, and I need your help. Raxa was pleased to be asked for help. Okay, he said. No more code until Thorn Valley is saved. <sighs> he sighed deeply. Thank you, said Nicodemus. Now what's this about lying and Jenner? You remember I didn't want the others to know about Jenner. So I told them my father lives in a mansion. I learned to read from the children's tutor there. But Brendan said an ordinary rat couldn't have learned to read and that my father must have been at the laboratory. So I'm afraid they're going to figure it out. And what if they do? They'll hate me for what he did. And they'll make fun of me for wanting to be a hero because my old man was... Rax's voice seemed to give out suddenly. I would say he was a rebel, Nicodemus said softly. Raxo thought of Jenner, scarred, bitter, and lonely. I don't want to lie about him, but I can't stand to tell the truth either, he admitted. Why not? They'll think it served him right, what happened to him. Nicodemus leaned his head against one paw thoughtfully. Why don't you tell them that you lied about your father living in the mansion, but that you had your own reasons for doing so, and ask them not to ask you more about it until you're ready to say more? Raxa was surprised. The advice would be difficult to follow, but he thought he could do it. Thank you, he said, relieved. I'm going for a walk in the garden, Nicodemus said. Would you like to come with me? Raxo nodded. They walked along a stone walkway bordered with glossy rhododendron. The walkway was overhung by taller plants and trees, and the effect, even in winter, was lovely and peaceful. Raxo had heard from Timothy that gardening was Nicodemus's hobby, but the older rat did not mention this. The walkway led into a small pine grove. Beyond the tree was a clear, fast-flowing brook. To one side, Raxo noticed a mossy bank with a small gray stone on it. The stone was a rectangle about six inches high with quartz crystals embedded along the sides. Raxo stared at it. They approached the stone and stood in front of it. Raxo saw that it had been engraved with the letter R. That's the first letter of my name, he said. Nicodemus smiled. I remember that I told you we want Thorn Valley to be a place where heroes are unnecessary. But the truth is that we haven't reached that point. The move oh. from Mr. Fitzgibbon's farm was a trial for us. For some, a test of faith. For others, a test of physical endurance. 
Two rats gave their lives so that we could make that move. This is a memorial to them. They stood for a moment in silence. Then Raxo asked, Who were they? One was a rat called Martha, who had come with us from Nim. She had tremendous strength and cunning and was almost fearless. She was older than most of us and had fought on the streets before she ever got to the laboratory. She volunteered to be part of the last guard, the rats who stayed to trick the humans into believing that they had destroyed an ordinary rat's nest. And the other? The truth is that we don't really know, Nicodemus said sadly. He was a large reddish rat who simply appeared on our doorstep at Mr. Fitzgibbon's farm in late winter, about a month before the move. He was practically starving. We gave him food and sent him away, but he kept on coming back. He said he wanted to pay us back for helping him out. Eventually, we let him stay. He was different from us. He was not bright even for a normal rat, and he never understood why we had decided to leave our nest. We tried to teach him letters, and he tried to learn, but R for red was the only letter he ever recognized. But what a worker! I don't know if we would have been ready to move if it hadn't been for him. He could move one pound of seed in a single carry, and he worked around the clock. The day came when the colony left for Thorn Valley. Nine of us stayed to destroy the nest. Red came back that night. I want to help, he said. We knew the end would be dangerous. Mrs. Frisby had overheard that Dr. Schultz from Nim planned to gas the nest to collect specimens. He suspected that some of us were the rats of Nim. At dawn, we heard the tractor start. They must have put a bulldozer blade on it, because we saw the roots of the rosebush fly up into the air. There was a terrible stench. I ran behind the others, toward the hidden door. I could see the sky when Justin stopped me. We're missing too. Red never spoke. He just turned around and went back in. I came out gasping. After the others had stopped circling and dodging, I counted later. Seven. Later, Brutus was pushed out. Red had saved him and gone back for Martha. They stood for a moment in silence. A question plagued Raxo. Finally, he asked, Why did he do it? I don't know. I've thought about it a lot. We've never been able to find his family or even where he came from. We never even got his body. The doctor took that too, and Martha's too. That's one of the reasons we put up this stone. ZR, said Raxo, does it stand for red? It stands for rat, Nicodemus said. It's for him and for Martha, and for other rats who work or die for what they believe in. Raxo looked at Nicodemus quickly. For well, what they believe in, he had said. Raxo realized suddenly that Nicodemus loved the colony, loved it so much that he had risked his life for it, so much that he would do almost anything to protect it from the world outside. Raxo thought about himself. He had longed to learn to read and write so that he could become a scientist and do experiments. He wanted to be successful and famous. He also wanted to be serious, to accomplish things that were important, that he cared about and could be proud of. Nicodemus seemed to read his mind. Last week, Elvira came to talk with me, he said. She's looking for an assistant to work in the lab with her, starting next summer. I knew you were interested in science, so I mentioned your name. She wasn't very enthusiastic at first, 
but after we talked a little longer, she thought it might work out. <laughs> he chuckled. I think the two of you could get along if you tried. Oh, Raxa was thrilled and terrified to work in the lab and do experiments, but to work with Elvira, who had the worst temper of any rat in the valley, except perhaps for Isabella. He struggled to keep his composure. I think I'd like that, he said. I'm sure I could help Elvira. I've sampled children's vitamins and cough drops in drugstores all over the city. I know all the best flavors and what they're made from. Medicine doesn't have to be bitter, you know. Nicodemus had turned his back as if he hadn't even heard what Raxo said. Isn't that the training unit lying up, lining up over there? I'm late, and Raxa was off in a flurry of legs and tail. The Basket January came to the valley. There was a thick frost on the ground. It was hard for the rats in the training unit to keep from shivering as each one approached Justin and was handed a folded piece of paper. Raxo sounded out the words the best he could. Special assignment, Raxo. You are to make a map of the south side of the creek to the large walnut tree on the bank approximately one mile to the east. Include any landmarks, be back by noon, your partner is Isabella. Raxo was pleased that he could read most of the assignment, and when he got to the word Isabella, he was overjoyed. When he found her, Isabella had just finished tying some vines onto a wicker basket so that she could wear it on her back like a knapsack. Raxo pulled his beret down over his ears. We're going together, you know. You and me? She glared. <clears throat> How could I forget? Raxo decided to be a gentleman. His manners would win her over. I've got my pen and some paper. Do we need anything else? <clears throat> you could use a few more inches if you ask me. He ignored the remark and put on his knapsack. Justin approached the two of them. What's this? You haven't left yet? We're just going now, Isabella said in a nicer tone of voice. Why are you taking that produce basket? Isn't that going to be clumsy in the brush? Isabella smiled sweetly. I'm in charge of dinner tonight, and I thought I might find some persimmons near the creek. Persimmons are one of your favorites, aren't they, Justin? Justin ignored the question. Run along now he said. Don't forget to blow the emergency whistle if you get into trouble, and try not to be late. And so they went together. Raxo hummed a cheerful tune as he led the way, with Isabella following solidly. There was a path along the south side of the pond, but beyond that the brush grew thick and they had to bushwhack their way through, pushing their shoulders hard against the wiry branches. The creek flowed swiftly beside them. It was clear and deep. In some spots, the water formed waves with frothy white caps along the tops. <clears throat> Raxo liked the way it looked, but he couldn't forget the time he had tried to go swimming on his way to Thorn Valley and had almost drowned. They spotted the walnut tree after a 20 minute walk. There were still a few lonely walnuts hanging on its bare limb. Raxo wanted to throw stones at them and knock them down, but Isabella said there was no time for that, and she made Raxo take the pen and paper out of his knapsack. He made a mark at the far end of the paper to represent the tree. You should write the words walnut tree, Isabella pointed out. Otherwise, that could be any tree on the south side of the creek. She was right. Raxo laboriously printed the letters W A L N U. Then he came to the end of the page. 
the letters were too big. Isabella was exasperated. Let me do it. She took another piece of paper, drew the tree, and wrote under it, in prim script, Walnut Tree. She drew perpendicular lines to represent the banks of the creek close to the tree. Raxon watched carefully. They pushed their way through the brambles to get closer to the shoreline. There was a small sandy beach just below them, but as they began to descend toward it, they heard a grating sound. What was that? Raxo looked around. The noise came again. It was harsh and scraping. It's coming from the creek, somewhere beyond the bend, Isabella said. Her voice had become a whisper, and she looked scared. We'd better hide, Raxo motioned toward the underbrush at the top of the bank. Isabella stared at... <clears throat> Isabella started to worm her way into the thicket, but the basket on her back became tangled in the branches. She struggled desperately. Calm down, Raxo whispered. He helped her slip the harness off her shoulders. The basket came free and rolled down the slope toward the water. Isabella started to go after it, but Raxo grabbed her by the paw and pulled her into the thicket. I heard voices, he whispered, and they didn't sound like us. What did they sound like? Isabella's eyes were huge. Like, Raxo hesitated. Could it be true? Like humans, he whispered. Something flashed in the winter sunlight. Where Timothy stood, part way up the mountain, he could see it clearly in the center of the Wiggly Green Creek. It was about a mile to the west of Emerald Pond, and it was glittering. Brendan saw it too. I think it's a boat, he said. Timothy couldn't take his eyes from the silvery spot. On the mountain, he was a spectator, but those who were close to the creek, even the rats at home in the nest, were in danger. He remembered Raxo's assignment. He and Isabella were mapping the creek just east of the Emerald Pond. We've got to warn everyone, he said, and if it is a boat and if it has people in it, we've got to make sure they don't make it all the way to the pond. Timothy closed his eyes. Could it be a bad dream? But when he opened them again, the silver spot was still there, moving slowly. He even thought he could see two tiny black dots inside it. People. We've got to tell Justin, Brendan said. Timothy reached into his knapsack and took out a reed whistle. He blew it hard. A long, shrill call floated down the mountain. In the valley, gray heads turned and looked up. Feet began running toward the sound. Raxo and Isabella heard the whistle, but they were too scared to move. The boat had come around the bend, and suddenly it was right in front of them. When it bumped a rock in the water, they heard the scraping sound again. There's a little beach, a voice said. Let's eat lunch. Isabella wouldn't open her eyes. She seemed to be frozen stiff. Raxo tried to calm her. The boat is called a canoe. And the two wooden sticks are paddles, he whispered in her ear. The American Indians use canoe. I know because I saw one in the movie, The Last of the Mohicans. There's a man and a woman in the boat. She has long red hair and glasses, and the man has a black beard and a knitted cap, a little bit like mine. They're right alongside the shore now. They're getting out. They're pulling the canoe up on the sand. They're going to sit on that old elm log just beneath us. Isabella shuddered. Raxo held her paw comfortingly. He couldn't talk anymore because the people were so close. The man's voice was deep and strong. How did you end up covering the dam story, Lindsay? I was one of the reporters at the state legislature when the money for the dam was passed, the young woman answered. Representative Jones sponsored the bill. At the time, I thought it was strange that he would do that, since most of his district is farmland. Sure enough, when I w went to some of the public meetings held by the farmers, they opposed the dam. 
on the ground that it would destroy their livelihood. But other people argued that this land is just being wasted as it is now. Wasted. The man shook his head sorrowfully. There are only a few wilderness areas left in this state, and Thorn Valley's the largest. If it's destroyed, all the animals that live here will die too. That's one of the reasons I asked you to come with me, Jack. If you take some photographs, I'll try to get them printed in the paper. That way, people will have a chance to see what Thorn Valley is like. I'm surprised other people haven't come here to go hiking or canoeing. Lindsay took a bite of her sandwich. Before the construction company blasted a road through the mountain, the valley was almost inaccessible, she said. The north end is a deep gorge, and where it ends, the river goes over a series of falls, too steep for boating. Jack stood up and stretched. I'll set up my tripod right here. We'll get some shots of the creek and that old walnut tree behind it. And then we'll do some of the mountain over there to the west. Great, but we can't take too long. I want you to get some pictures of the gorge too, and the area where the dam construction is going on. Christopher and Sally were on the west side of the creek when the whistle blew. They had not seen or heard the boat and were only half finished with their map. Christopher was climbing a tall pine tree. He had figured that the view from its top limbs would show every curve along the west bank of the creek bed. That would make finishing the map an easy job. When he heard the whistle, he couldn't believe his ears. Who could be in trouble? And where? The noise sounded as if it had come from the mountain. They were supposed to run immediately in the direction of the sound, but Christopher had a better idea. He decided to crawl out on a branch to see what the problem was. When she finished her sandwich, Lindsay rinsed her hands off in the creek. Burr, she said. Ah, water's freezing. She bent over. What's this? Jack went and stood beside her. I'll be darned. There must have been people here. And not too long ago. His back was to Raxo. He seemed to be poking at something with his finger. It looks like a toy, but it's beautifully made. It couldn't have been here long, or it would have rotted. Look at these vines. They're almost like a little harness. The woman turned back toward the bank. Now, his eyes wide with boredom, Raxo could see the basket cradled in her hand. The moment he spent on the limb of the pine tree seemed to Christopher like the longest moment of his whole life. He had never seen humans before, had never expected to see them, so that he felt as if he were in a dream. When the one with the red hair picked up the basket, one of their baskets, he felt sure, though how it could have gotten there was more than he could guess. He had to do something, but what? Below him, he could hear Sally. Christopher, come down out of that tree. We're supposed to go as soon as the whistle blows. Christopher, didn't you hear the whistle? We're going to get in big trouble. Come back down here. He had to shut her up. He leaned over and waved the bottom part of the branch desperately, trying to signal that there was trouble. He was afraid to call out loud. Bending over on the tip of the limb, he heard the branch begin to crack. Later, that was all he remembered. The red-haired woman whirled around when she heard the crash. She grabbed Jack by the arm. What was that? It came from the pine tree across the creek, I think. See, the branches are still moving. We may have scared an animal that was nesting there. It gives me the creeps. I feel like someone was spying on us. Want to have a look? She laughed nervously. <laughs> I think I'll stay here. You go. Raxa watched carefully as the man launched the canoe and ferried carefully across the creek. He got out on the opposite shore, climbed up the bank, and pushed through thick underbrush to get to the tree. Raxo himself did not know what had made the crashing sound. He expected that it was simply the falling of an old branch. What he did know was what had happened to the basket. The woman had dropped it when she whirled around. 
It was in plain view on the ground, about a foot in front of the elm log, where the people had sat to eat lunch. The woman was facing the opposite shore, her hands stuck into the pockets of her green parka. Raxa was not sure he could get it, but he felt he had to try. If they took it with them, they might figure out that it was not a toy. And then what? <clears throat> he whispered to Isabella to stay put, then crept to the edge of the thicket. The woman had it moved. Raxo came out of the bramble and braced himself carefully as he descended the bank step by step. Jack, did you find anything? Silence. Jack, Jack! Lindsay, I'll be back over there in a minute. Jack's voice came from the underbrush. Raxo reached the elm log and crouched behind it. His lungs felt as if they were ready to burst, and he realized that he'd been holding his breath. He breathed slowly, steadily. They'd practiced that in the training sessions. He could see the woman's hiking boots still turned toward the creek. Slowly, he crept over the log, down onto the sand. His steps were slow, silent, but his heart was pounding. The basket was just an inch from his nose when he heard the paddle clank against the side of the aluminum canoe. The man was coming back. Raxo grabbed the basket in his mouth and ran up the bank, dodging through frozen stalks of milkweed. When he got to the top, he looked back. The woman was helping Jack pull the canoe back onto the sand. They hadn't seen him at all. There was blood, Jack said. It was still warm. And the branch was there too, a fairly small one. It was rotted most of the way through. It must have collapsed under the weight of the animal. So someone was spying on us, she said. I don't blame them, whoever they are. This is their valley. They have reason to fear us. They can't know that. They can sense it. What do you think it was? A raccoon or a possum, probably. Too bad I didn't get a shot of it when I took the photographs. She seemed reassured at the thought of a raccoon. We'd better get back on the river, she said. It's quarter of one. He nodded. What did you do with that little basket? I must have dropped it when I heard the crash. They both bent over the sand, looking. She walked back toward the elm log and rummaged through the milkweed stalks. She even looked up the bank toward the thicket, but it was nowhere to be found. You must have dropped it into the creek. Jack said. The water swept it away. Maybe, she frowned. It sure was strange. Who would have brought a little kid with toys into the wilderness? Jack grinned. He pulled the canoe around so that it was facing downstream. Maybe it belonged to your spy, he said, swinging his leg over the side of the boat. Very funny. She rolled her eyes grabbed the remaining paddle from the beach and clambered into the front of the canoe. Their paddles dipped into the dark green water once, twice, three times, and the canoe went out of sight around the bend.